Perfect. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, this press conference on April 30th from the Unified Com Command. My name is Fields Mosley. I'm the Communications Director for Maricopa County. I'm also the lead PIO for the Joint Information Center, which is serving for the Unified Command. So we'd like to thank all the reporters who are joining us uh, via the webinar today. We'd also like to thank anybody from the general public joining us on YouTube or on Facebook today. We appreciate you uh, coming here to get some information uh, about how we're dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic from the Maricopa County point of view. Dr. Rebecca Sonnenshine will start today by updating us with some of the numbers, the numbers of cases, also talking about the number of deaths in Maricopa County. She will uh, then talk about the types of tests available to everybody in the public right now. We, uh, many of you know that Arizona is starting what they're calling a testing blitz uh, this Saturday. And so it's important to know what kind of tests are out there from uh, healthcare providers. Um, so Dr. Sonnenshine will join us. We also have uh, Robert Rowley, who's the director of our emergency management uh, department. He is here today in case there are any questions about uh, personal protective equipment and the availability of that. So before we go on to a few logistics here, um, members of the media will be called upon uh, by the moderator online in the webinar to uh, unmute, unmute your mic. You'll raise your hand virtually and then he will call upon you to ask a question. Please only ask one question at a time. As you know, we're not only trying to answer your question, uh, we're also answering those questions in Spanish for any of our listeners who are uh, bilingual or speak Spanish only. So we want to do that as quickly as possible. We always try to come back around and answer any of those follow-up questions that you might have. So if you're having difficulty raising your hand in the webinar, or if your mic won't unmute, please don't keep clicking away on that. We know there are some hiccups in the software because of the sheer volume of people that are using GoToWebinar at this time of day every day. And uh, if you have to log out and then log back in, or you have to call into the webinar, we will try to get to your question. As always, if you have questions that we're not able to answer today or you're not able to get through for some reason, you are welcome to email caomedia at maricopa.gov. With that, here is Dr. Rebecca Sonnenschein. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Rebecca Sonnenschein, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, S-U-N-E-N-S-H-I-N-E, -E -E, Medical Director for Disease Control at Maricopa County Public Health. So I want to start today with an overview of where we are with cases right now in Maricopa County, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of testing available to the public. We have almost 4,000 confirmed cases in Maricopa County to date, and 17% of those have been hospitalized at some point during their illness, which is about one in five confirmed cases. Tragically, we've had 145 deaths related to COVID-19, and 98% of those deaths fall into the high-risk group, which means 65 years or older, or someone who has a chronic medical condition. Our hospitalization epidemiology curve, or EPI curve, shows us that cases of more severe disease in Maricopa County um, likely peaked in mid-April and have slightly decreased since, since then and now are starting to level off. This is a good snapshot of the overall trend of the outbreak and helps us estimate what is happening in the community even when testing is not widely available. So this is really good news because it means that the social distancing that we have put in place continues to work. And that if we can keep our number of hospitalized cases at this level or below this level, we won't overwhelm our healthcare system and everyone can get the care that they need. So we know there are a lot of questions about testing for COVID-19, and I wanna provide the public with some more details about the different types of testing out there and what the testing can tell healthcare providers and public health. There are two main types of tests. The first one is the PCR test, which are mostly used for diagnosis of active infection. And the second main type are antibody tests, which are typically used to test for recent or past infection with COVID-19. 
PCR tests, or polymerase chain reaction tests, is the test that is most commonly used to diagnose active COVID-19 and detects the genetic material of the virus in the nose. These tests tell us is if someone is currently infected with COVID-19. We believe people are typically contagious from about two days before they develop symptoms until a little over a week after symptoms start. Because this test can detect both living and dead virus in the nose, a positive test doesn't necessarily mean that a person, a person is contagious or infectious with the disease. In fact, the virus can be detected in the nose for weeks after someone is no longer infectious. This is the most accurate test that we have available to test for COVID-19. If someone has symptoms of COVID-19, it's the best test to determine if they have the disease right now. Positive results from these tests are automatically sent to the Arizona Department of Health Services and shared with Maricopa County. And this is the majority of results that we use to contact and investigate cases of COVID-19. PCR tests are almost always accurate when they are positive but a negative result doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have the infection, although it makes it much less likely. So now I'm gonna switch over to serology or antibody testing. This is the other main type of test that has gotten a lot of attention lately, and it's, it's called antibody or serology testing. And while PCR tells us if somebody is currently infected, an antibody test tells us if someone has had COVID-19 recently or in the past. Antibody tests do not detect the virus itself. Instead, they detect whether someone has the antibodies in their immune system that fight off the virus of COVID-19. Antibody tests look at two different types of antibodies. One is called IgM and the other is called IgG. IgM antibodies first appear beginning a few days after you're infected with the virus, and IgG antibodies take longer to develop, usually one to two weeks after you become infected. IgG antibodies take longer to develop, but they, they tell us that someone has been infected in the past and is likely no longer contagious. The FDA has not approved any antibody tests at this time, although some have been given what's called an emergency use authorization, which is like a fast track through the FDA, and it doesn't require as much research or testing to get an EUA. The problem with these tests is that they haven't been studied enough to know how often there are either false positive tests or false negative test results. And for this reason, many experts don't trust the results enough to use them to diagnose someone with COVID-19. A false positive test result could lead someone to think that they are immune to the virus, which could actually be more dangerous than not getting a test at all. What these tests are most useful for is to give us a sense of how many people in a population like Maricopa County have been exposed to COVID-19 possibly without ever even knowing that they were infected. Understanding this information helps us make decisions about strategies to prevent the spread of COVID-19 because it tells us how many, in the people, how many people in the community likely have some protection against the virus. Unfortunately, we still don't know for sure that having the antibody means that you can't get infected again or that you're fully protected from the virus. What we do know from similar diseases like SARS is that the antibody likely provides some protection for at least a few years. Positive results for these tests automatically are sent to Arizona Department of Health Services and are shared with Maricopa County Public Health. And while we are still researching antibody tests, public health does not recommend using the results for individual patient care decisions. So what do we recommend about COVID-19 testing for people in the public? If you have symptoms of COVID-19 or think you might have been exposed to someone with the virus, 
call a healthcare provider, or use the CDC symptom checker at maricopa.gov COVID-19. A PCR is the most appropriate test if you have symptoms. You can get tested through a healthcare provider or at a drive-through testing site. If you are curious about whether you had COVID-19 in the past, ask for a serology test, but make sure you continue to protect yourself regardless of the result. Wash your hands, don't touch your face, stay six feet away from others, and please, please stay home and away from others if you are sick. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sun and Shine, uh, for that uh, information about testing and who should be involved in testing. We'll now open it up to questions. I want to remind everybody, uh, Joanna Molina is here from Public Health. She will be interpreting answers to questions uh, as best she can into Spanish. Uh, so if we do have some uh, Spanish language television stations or radio stations on with us today, uh, that'll be your opportunity to, to get an answer for your questions as well in Spanish if you need them. And please make uh, special requests if you need an answer in Spanish. So uh, with that, uh, Chad, do we have anybody on the line uh, waiting to ask a question today? Mm -hmm. Ann Ryman has a question. Ann, your microphone is live. Hi, could you talk a little bit about um, what kind of trends you're seeing at the nursing homes and assisted living facilities and about the testing that's available there? And then also, are you seeing more assisted living or more nursing home uh, environments? Which one is getting more of the cases? So the trends we're seeing in long-term care facilities of specific types, we're talking about assisted living and nursing homes, and uh, what kind of testing ability they have in assisted care uh, facilities and nursing homes, and uh, any sort of trends we can break down. Uh, Dr. Sunshine can address uh, at least part of uh, a partial answer, at least, to that one. So we've known since the very beginning of this outbreak that residents of nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities and assisted living are at the highest risk of severe complications of COVID-19. And that's why when this outbreak first began, we developed a system to reach out to both skilled nursing facilities and assisted living to check in with them on a weekly basis to see not only how many cases they have, but how many people have respiratory illness and how many people are being hospitalized. So we're checking in with them every week and as soon as we have people who develop symptoms, those long-term care facilities are offered testing immediately for every single person in that facility who has symptoms so that we can quickly diagnose them and make sure that they are put in isolation precautions so that not only all the other residents are protected, but also the staff who are caring for those residents. We also work closely with them to make sure they have all of the personal protective equipment they need to continue to maintain isolation, not just for the residents who have been diagnosed with the disease, but for every single person in the facility. So what I want to add about, what was the second part? It was about trends, uh, trends. assisted living versus nursing homes. Okay, so do you want to go ahead and translate? Yes. And then we'll go to the next one. Gracias. Mm -hmm. La pregunta fue que cuáles son las pruebas y si hay suficientes para los centros de cuidado médico de largo plazo. Y la respuesta al momento es que trabajamos muy de cerca con estos centros de cuidado médico de largo plazo para las personas que viven en ellos, que están recibiendo cuidado médico, que tienen alguna condición crónica. Y en caso de que se presentara algún resultado positivo de COVID-19, se nos reporta a nosotros en Salud Pública del Condado Maricopa. Trabajamos de cerca para darles las pruebas necesarias, para darles el equipo de protección personal, para que tanto el personal de la localidad, al igual que los enfermos, puedan contar con ellos y proteger al resto de la comunidad en ese centro de cuidado de largo plazo. So regarding the trends of cases in long-term care facilities, we know that as long as COVID-19 is circulating in the community and our health care workers are being exposed, that we will continue to see some cases in our long-term care facilities. Our goal is to identify those cases as quickly as possible and to make sure that everyone in that uh, nursing facility 
is isolated so that the disease doesn't spread. So while we are seeing more nursing homes that have at least one case of COVID-19, most of our facilities only have one or two cases because we have been very effective at stopping the spread. And that's what I really do want people to focus on is how much we're working with those facilities. And that includes working with the facilities to communicate with residents and their families about what's being done in the, in the facility to protect their loved ones and what's being done to make sure that there's no spread in the facility in general. La segunda pregunta fue que cuál es la modalidad que se está viendo ya sea en los hospicios, en los centros de cuidado médico de largo plazo para personas mayores. Y la realidad es que hemos visto que cuando las personas están enfermas, realmente nos comunicamos inmediatamente para poder proveer las pruebas. Por lo regular se ve uno a dos casos y eso es la rapidez con la que se puede trabajar con estos centros, teniendo esa comunicación y ofreciéndoles todos los recursos que necesiten para evitar que se siga propagando en la comunidad o en los residentes que ellos tienen. All right, thank you for the question, Anne. Uh, do we have another question? Yes, Melissa Blasius has a question. Melissa, looks like the microphone is muted on your end. If you'll unmute that, you can speak with us now. Yes, hi, can you guys hear me? We can, yes. Melissa. Great. Um, so, so also, again, talking about the nursing homes, once that information is given to the public health department, the data, just the, the, the raw number and the facility, how is that not a public record? Or is it a public record in your mind? So the question is about the public record. So this is a reframing of the uh, of whether or not this data is open to the public. Uh, I believe Dr. Christ and the governor uh, answered this question uh, several times yesterday. But uh, once again, uh, Dr. Sun and Shine will talk about that just a little bit. Maricopa County Public Health collects lots of information about cases of communicable disease. Some of that information can be released to the public, but information that can be used to identify an individual like their home address is absolutely private and not considered public record. And that is by state statute. So a nursing home resident's home address, which is the residence of the nursing home, which can easily be identified by giving the name of the nursing home, is therefore not considered public record. La pregunta fue acerca del récord público, que si una vez que se reportan el número de casos de estos centros de cuidado médico de largo plazo, ¿por qué no se da a conocer en dónde sucedió esto? La respuesta es que debido a la confidencialidad que existe, porque se pueden identificar tan, con tanto las direcciones como los nombres de las personas que están enfermas, eso se protege por ley. Entonces, no se pueden dar esos detalles al momento. All right, thank you. And thank you, Melissa, for the question. Is there another question, Chad? We have a question from Tom Scanlon. Tom, your microphone is live. Yes, thank you. I'm looking at a state chart that shows inpatient COVID-19 patients uh, from today of 755, which is actually a little bit higher than a week and two weeks ago. Do you have the Maricopa County inpatient COVID-19 beds in use today and a week and two weeks ago to compare, please. I, so we're talking about inpatient. You're talking about hospitalizations, Tom? Yes, it's uh, inpatient. Uh, so, so, okay, I know hospitalizations, uh, that, uh, that curve is on our uh, data that goes out on our website every single day at maricopa.gov slash COVID-19, uh, but Dr. Sunshine can expand upon that a little bit. So if you look at the trend of hospitalizations specifically in Maricopa County, what you can see is that compared to two weeks ago, that number is roughly the same per day or even slightly decreased. So we are not necessarily seeing the exact same thing in Maricopa County compared with the rest of the state, but what we can say is that hospitalization levels are stable and, and generally might even be decreasing. 
La pregunta fue que si ha habido un aumento en los casos de hospitalización a nivel estatal. Y hablando del Condado Maricopa solamente, lo que hemos visto nosotros en la gráfica de hospitalizaciones es que varía un poco de dos semanas al, al momento, pero los números se han mantenido estables. Entonces, si podemos decir algo, es que esos números han estado bajando lentamente. All right, thank you, Tom, for that question. Uh, Chad, do we have somebody else with a question? Graham Resnick has a question. Uh, Graham, your microphone is live now. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, Fields. Uh, you too, Graham. I'd like to ask Dr. Sunshine, can you talk uh, a bit more about the testing blitz coming up this weekend and why it's important uh, that we increase the number of tests uh, done in Arizona and what that could tell us? I think, uh, you know, the testing blitz, of course, is a, is a program being run by ADHS, and, uh, and I believe they have private partners that are working on this. I know Banner Health was one of the ones listed on the website, and they're going to be helping at those various locations. Uh, we obviously all recognize that there is an importance of testing in our community as we push forward, and I believe Dr. Sunshine can address testing from that point of view. I think rather than emphasizing testing as many people as possible, what we, want, what we want to focus on is making sure that anyone who has symptoms of the disease can get tested readily and that there are enough supplies available so that healthcare providers can collect the specimens and, so, and that there is enough personal protective equipment so that people can collect the specimens safely. And the availability of testing is based on all three of those things, the labs being able to provide the test, the specimen collection kits being available and that personal protective equipment. And until we get to the point where all three of those things can be readily accessed, um, you know, we need, we have work to do on making testing more available. So in addition to people who have symptoms, we also want to make sure that someone who has a known exposure to someone with confirmed COVID-19 can also get a test to determine if they are infected with the virus right now. But it's important to remember that that test that we use typically is the PCR test, and you can develop disease anywhere up to 14 days after you've been exposed. So if you get tested just a few days after you were exposed to somebody with the virus, you could still develop disease later, even if the test is negative. So there are important things for people to, to keep in mind, and most important, if you have symptoms, please get tested, and if you think you've been exposed, talk to a healthcare provider about getting the test. La pregunta fue que si es importante hacer estas pruebas masivas de las que se ha estado hablando que sucederán empezando este fin de semana y por qué es importante aumentar el número de pruebas y qué nos va a develar esa información. La respuesta en este caso para el condado Maricopa viene siendo que no nos vamos a enfocar tanto en hacer tantas pruebas, sino más bien en los resultados de cómo se pueden hacer estas pruebas. El que tenga los laboratorios, el acceso para recoger las muestras, el que tenga también el equipo personal de protección para los proveedores, darse estas pruebas. Entonces, es un conjunto de cosas que ya están disponibles y que la gente puede optar por hacerse estas pruebas. Específicamente aquellos que han mostrado los síntomas son los que se deben de hacer estas pruebas. Aunque alguien que quiera saber si lo tuvo en el pasado, también quizás se lo puede hacer para ver si presenta alguno de los síntomas. Aunque me vamos a mencionar que una persona que quizás ha estado expuesta a alguien que tiene COVID-19, los síntomas pueden presentarse de 2 a 14 días. Así que si se hizo la prueba, pero en 14 días presenta los síntomas, esa prueba quizás le va a dar un resultado falso. Por eso es muy importante enfocarnos en qué hacer pruebas basado en los síntomas que se presentan. Graham, thanks so much for the question. Uh, Chad, do we have somebody else waiting to ask a question right now? Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if the county plans on reporting numbers of recovered cases, and if so, how um, will you determine who qualifies as recovered? So the question about recovered cases, and uh, are we going to start tracking that? I know you've answered this question in the past, uh, and uh, Dr. Sunshine will talk a little bit uh, more about recovered cases and whether or not that's even possible to track that. So 
Generally speaking, our most important mission in public health is to contact the cases once they have become ill and have been diagnosed and make sure we understand everyone uh, who they have been around when they were infectious, which is that contact investigation or contact tracing that you've heard so much about. That is taking the majority of our resources, and typically we do not contact cases again to find out how long they were ill or if they have recovered. So that is something that we don't typically do because its role in public health is not nearly as well established as the role of contact tracing, which is our, our primary goal. La pregunta fue que el número de casos eh, que se han recuperado, si se van a dar a conocer y cuándo se darán a conocer esos números. En el caso del condado Maricopa, una vez que una persona ha sido eh, diagnosticada con COVID-19, se le contacta y la misión de salud pública es contactar a las personas que estuvieron cercanas con esa persona infectada para seguir haciendo la investigación de otras personas que pudieron estar expuestas. Pero nuestro rol no es necesariamente investigar si las personas se recuperaron o cuándo fue que se recuperaron. Thank you for the question. Chad, do we have somebody else? I have a question from Alejandro Barahona. Uh, Alejandro, your microphone's live. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, could we briefly explain the uh, testing process? For example, you call in or you can just show up at one of these testing sites and what type of ID will be required. A lot of our audience, uh, or the Hispanic Latino community, might not have a valid state ID, but they might be, you know, suffering from COVID-19, and they are wondering whether or not they will be allowed to be tested. Yeah, I, I understand your question, Alejandro. As I said before, uh, the, the testing sites that have been advertised at least this week uh, coming from the state and what they've called the testing blitz, that's really an ADHS program and all of that information is on the website. Uh, we can certainly direct you that way where there's more information that you can learn about. There's also a phone number you can call that's associated with that, but most of the screening is being done online. I don't know if there's an ID check required. Let me go ahead and give you this phone number. My researchers behind the cameras are looking this up for me. 844-542-8201. Uh, 844-542-8201. Two zero one is the phone number, and I would en encourage you to direct your, your viewers or your listeners there or your readers and, uh, and call that number or go to the website through ADHS. Um, that's going to be your best source of information. Whenever it comes to these, these mass uh, testings or the testing blitz that they've discussed uh, or presented, the state has, and uh, also, of course, your primary care provider, uh, doctors around the community are able to access the testing for those people that are symptomatic, at least, and perhaps even more people. I think uh, we'll have Joanna translate that. Bueno, la pregunta fue que, ¿cómo va a funcionar la prueba? Las masivas que empezarán a realizarse y qué documentación se le pedirá a la comunidad. Muchas de la gente que quizás está viendo esos programas no tenga la documentación necesaria para poder presentarla en uno de estos sitios. El trabajo de Condado Maricopa en este momento solamente estamos colaborando con el Departamento de Salud de, Servicio, de Servicios de Salud del Estado. Ellos son los que se han encargado de hacer estas pruebas masivas que iniciarán mañana. Y la gente puede llamar a un teléfono para verificar qué es lo que se estará pidiendo. El teléfono es el 1 844 542 8201. Voy a repetir, 1-844-542-8201. All right, thank you for the question about the testing. Obviously, a lot of talk about that this week with the announcement of the testing blitz. Uh, it's, um, I, I hope we've given you enough information today, but I certainly encourage uh, you to go to that website and, and share that with your, your viewers, your readers, or your listeners. Do we have another question right now, Chad? Stephanie Inez has a question. Stephanie, your microphone is live. Hi, um, thank you very much for taking my question. So on um, the testing blitz, I know the state is running that, but because they're going to be testing so many people, wouldn't that cause a big spike in positive cases in Maricopa County? And if so, how do we interpret that spike of positive cases? 
so Stephanie, if I'm understanding your question uh, correctly, we, you know, how, how are we interpreting any data that might come out of a, a large amount of testing that all of a sudden flows into this, uh, into our data, and how do we interpret that, especially with so much going on in Maricopa County? Uh, Dr. Sunshine will take that question. Hi, Stephanie. That's a, a really good question, and it's exactly why whenever you hear me talking about the status of COVID-19 in our community, I always refer to that hospitalization epidemiology curve because we know that people who are hospitalized have always been able to get testing since the beginning of this pandemic. And we know that just our cases in general tend to vary day to day depending on how much testing is available. So with the events that are occurring over the next few Saturdays or what ADHS calls the blitz, we know we're gonna see a sudden increase in the number of cases just because there's a lot more testing being done and it will make it look like the number of cases is increasing when really those people are already out in the community and already infected. So that's why we don't rely as heavily on those case numbers for the trends and we look to that hospitalization epidemiology curve. La pregunta fue que si ahora con las pruebas masivas que iniciarán a hacerse los fines de semana empezando este sábado, obviamente subirán el número de casos positivos y también cómo vamos a interpretar esos números en salud pública. Eh, lo que se ha recomendado en este momento es que la gente se va a hacer las pruebas, obviamente van a subir esos números y por eso nosotros recomendamos que nos, nos guiamos por la gráfica de hospitalizaciones. Esas personas ya han sido, se les ha hecho la prueba, sabemos dónde están, sabemos cómo va la modalidad hasta el momento y sabemos que eso es lo que nos va a decir si seguirá subiendo o bajando el número de casos. Entonces esa es la recomendación que sabemos que mucha gente está infectada en la comunidad y no se ha hecho una prueba al momento, pero ahora con estas pruebas van a subir esos casos y por eso nos guiamos por la gráfica de hospitalizaciones. Thank you Stephanie for the question. Uh, do we have another question right now? Yes, Melissa has a follow-up question. Um, let's see, you are uh, once again self-muted. If you could unmute your microphone's live. Hi, thanks again for, for taking another question. I, I did want to know if, it, it, and you don't have to have, have it off the tip of your tongue, the state statute that uh, Dr. Sunshine mentioned, if one of you can send it to me at some point, that would be great today. Uh, and then uh, the, the one where you, the health privacy one that you are citing. And then I did have a question about actually getting a test. We, we've had some, some viewers who try to get testing this week through Walgreens with, uh, on the understanding that, that, uh, that Dr. Chris now has a standing order that would allow pretty much anybody who thought they might be exposed to get tested, and they were declined. Heard from a couple of other viewers who tried to go to other testing sites and were declined because they didn't have bad enough symptoms or enough symptoms or enough rationale that the provider thought they should get tested. Um, can you explain, the, is, is there a difference between what the state is saying about who qualifies and then who's actually getting tested? Uh, that would be a question, Melissa, for you to ask of the state. And as far as the, uh, we'll work on getting some some guidance on the confidentiality laws. You're right, I don't have the 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 uh, title numbers and uh, to tell you where to go and research the confidentiality uh, laws uh, for the state of Arizona, but uh, we'll, we'll work on getting something on that for you. As far as the guidance on who gets tested and who doesn't, uh, I, that's, a, that's a business question for whether it be Walgreens or CVS or any of the other medical providers out there. Certainly there is guidance that has come from the state of Arizona, from ADHS, also uh, from the CDC about who should be receiving testing at this time and what those symptoms are. Uh, how a doctor or a pharmacist is making those judgment calls at those businesses, that would be a question for those businesses. Thanks for the question. Sure.
La pregunta fue que sí, que, ¿cuáles son los criterios para hacerse las pruebas? Porque ha habido casos en que algunos televidentes han acudido a hacerse las pruebas y se les ha negado. Entonces, ¿en qué nos estamos basando para esas pruebas? Estas pruebas masivas vienen del el Centro de Servicios o del Departamento de Servicios de Salud del Estado. Estamos colaborando con ellos y la respuesta es que debemos investigar quizás, hablar con esos negocios que lo han negado, esas farmacias o esas clínicas y saber cuál es la razón. Para saber cuál es la guía que el Estado está dando, les recomendamos que vayan al sitio de internet del Estado para poder saber quiénes se deben de hacer la prueba. Thank you, Melissa, for the follow-up question. Uh, Chad, do we have somebody else? We do. Ann Ryman has a question. Ann, your microphone is live. Hi. Uh, a question on nursing homes and assisted living and PPE. What are you hearing from them about the status of PPE? Is there enough or is there still a shortage? I'm going to look for uh, Robert Rowley, our Director of Emergency Management, uh, can talk a little bit about the PPE supply. Uh, certainly, uh, the Unified Command has prioritized long-term care facilities, but he can kind of give us a brief update on where we are on personal protective equipment. So the, the short answer is uh, PPE for uh, long-term care facilities has been a concern, but to this date, we have been able to uh, meet their supply needs so that nobody has ran out of any critical PPE. We are very short currently on surgical gowns, and we are addressing uh, various avenues to make sure that we can restock our supply so we can keep the long-term care facilities uh, in supply with any necessary PPE. I will also say to date, with supplies that we had existing, as well as from the Strategic National Stockpile, from state uh, ADHS, and from donations, we have currently supplied to this day over half a million pieces of PPE to uh, long-term care facilities, healthcare facilities, and our first responders. La pregunta fue que si, um, ¿cuál es el, cuál es, cómo está ahorita el recurso de tener el equipo de protección personal en las instalaciones que provee cuidado médico de largo plazo? La respuesta es que se ha estado solicitando el, lo que es el equipo de protección personal y se ha estado supliendo a esas instalaciones. Sí está bajo lo que viene siendo poder suplirlos. Hay una necesidad en este momento de las batas médicas quirúrgicas para esas instalaciones y hemos estado trabajando a nivel nacional también para suplir esas necesidades. Más de medio millón de piezas consideradas de equipo de protección personal se han entregado a estos centros de cuidado médico de largo plazo. Thank you for that question. Uh, do we have another questioner? Another reporter on the line? Thomas Scanlon has a question. Okay. Your microphone is live. Thank you again. Uh, can you please tell me how many long-term care facilities there are in Maricopa County, and if there's been discussion of an attempt to test each individual in Maricopa County who is in a long-term care facility as, as you've mentioned, it, those are the people that are the extreme highest risk. Okay, so how many long-term care, care facilities, which I know cover a number of different types of facilities, uh, the number I've heard is 500, over f more than 500 of those types of facilities in Maricopa County, so are obviously a, l a large number. Uh, we've had some discussions over the last few weeks with the reporters about the what these facilities look like. I think it's really important to note that some of them have just a handful of people living in what is essentially a home, and while others have obviously hundreds of residents. So uh, that uh, might help you understand uh, where we are on this. And are we, is there an attempt to mass test? Uh, Dr. Sunshine will answer that part of the question. What we're doing right now is we are making sure that a facility with even one case of COVID-19 in a resident or a staff has testing available to anyone who presents with symptoms in that facility. We are in discussions with partners who might be able to offer testing to everyone in facilities that are either affected with a case or not affected with a case, but we are not at the point yet where there is enough testing and particularly testing supplies available where we can offer that level of testing. But if we were to start testing individuals who do not have symptoms broadly, the first place that we are looking is long-term care facility residents. 
La pregunta fue, ¿cuántas instalaciones de cuidado médico de largo plazo existen en el condado Maricopa? Y si se piensan hacer pruebas a cada uno de los residentes en estas ubicaciones. La, lo, la respuesta es que hay más de 500 instalaciones de cuidado médico de largo plazo en el condado Maricopa. Algunos de estos casos incluye solamente casas con pocos residentes hasta instalaciones que tienen cientos de residentes. Entonces, otra de las respuestas es que si se va a hacer pruebas a cada uno de esos lugares, al momento no existe lo que viene siendo el equipo de protección personal para hacer pruebas a todos los residentes de esas instalaciones, especialmente si no presentan síntomas. Sin embargo, si estamos trabajando de cerca con socios y que se llegara a dar la oportunidad de hacer estas pruebas, serían esas instalaciones donde se realizarían estas pruebas. Tom, thank you for the question. Chad, do we have a, another reporter with a question? We do. Brian Resnick has a follow-up question. Grant, your microphone's live. Uh, thank you, Chad. Thank you, Fields. Uh, I want to go back to my original question um, of Dr. Sunshine uh, and the testing blitz. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but how concerned are you that this massive effort might overwhelm what you see to describe as a limited number of tests available? And also, can you speak to what this kind of effort, in a generic sense, can mean toward a loosening of restrictions uh, on our lives? So, I, so, sorry, Bram, I'm gonna to try to rephrase your question, so correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. What kind of, uh, are we concerned about uh, that some, how some sort of mass testing is going to skew the numbers, or, or how does this mass testing blitz fit into the overall shortage of tests nationwide? Is that, yeah, is well, that correct? More, well, Dr. Sunshine is talking about the shortage of tests here, but for, she just a minute ago talked about um, you know, not having enough supply, uh, and her answer seemed to say we need to do these three things. So yes, the question is, okay. is she concerned about a testing blitz, blitz making the shortage even worse, or to put this another way, are we up? Do we have enough supply to do a mass uh, testing blitz to do you know double the number of tests in Arizona uh, every week? Yeah, I think uh, I, I think it might help to understand. Um, you know, where the tests are coming from and who has the tests right now. So I think that's part of the, the answer as well. Dr. Sunshine will field this one. The Arizona Department of Health Services did develop this concept of the testing blitz. So I wanna make sure that everyone knows that I'm not speaking on behalf of the State Health Department. That being said, the way that they identified providers to participate in this effort was to first make sure that those who participate have enough personal protective equipment to collect the specimens safely, and that they have enough testing supplies and they have the capacity to send the tests to a lab. So they are all able to provide those materials in order to participate in this effort. So I think, I think what's challenging is there are some companies and some, um, some healthcare providers that have access to adequate personal protective equipment, testing supplies, and a laboratory and some that do not. And it may differ by area, by healthcare provider, by healthcare facility type. And, and so the issue for us is that it's not widely available and consistently available, but these providers would not be participating if they didn't have sufficient supplies. And um, I can't answer your question about how this increase in test results will affect our ability to uh, relax social distancing. That is a decision that is really up to the governor who announced yesterday that we're at a point where we need to watch and wait and hold on to the measures that we're continuing to do at least until the middle of May. And um, I think with the more testing that we can do and the more testing that we make available, uh, the more information that the governor will have in order to make these important decisions for the public. La pregunta fue, ¿qué tan preocupados estamos en hacer este tipo de pruebas masivas y la falta de pruebas, quizás, y de equipo necesario para realizarlas? 
Bueno, en el Condado Maricopa solamente podemos hablar por lo que es el Departamento de Salud del Condado. Estas pruebas masivas vienen del Departamento de Salud del Estado. Obviamente ellos están trabajando con socios que deben de tener todo el equipo necesario para hacer las pruebas, incluyendo desde recoger las muestras, tener el equipo de protección personal y llevar esas muestras a laboratorios. Entonces, esas son las instalaciones que están colaborando para hacer estas pruebas masivas. En cuestión de que si es, ¿qué tan relajado? Vamos a hacer relajar el distanciamiento social eh, cuando vemos números que están subiendo. Eso es algo que debemos saber cuánta gente está expuesta y esos números van a empezar a llegar. El, esa, la pregunta de distanciamiento social solamente la puede tomar el gobernador y para eso tenemos que esperar hasta el 15 de mayo para saber nosotros en qué está en este caso los casos de COVID-19. All right, so we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, so kind of watching the clock here a little bit. Uh, Chad, do we have somebody else with a question right now? We do. Uh, Anne Ryman has a follow-up, and your microphone is live. Anne? You answered my question, but thank you. All right, thank you, Anne. Chad, anybody else? One more from Brian Webb. Um, Brian? You're self-muted. If you'll unmute, we can hear you. There we go. Hi, Field. Thanks, Chad. Um, just quickly, is there an estimate of the number of new cases we will see in the county based on the tests done during the blitz and infection rates? Is that a simple equation, and do we happen to have that number handy? Uh, that's not a simple equation. No, we don't have that. And I think that kind of goes back to how Dr. Sunshine just answered that last question. It's a, a little bit different twist. But uh, no, we're, we're not able to see into the future and understand how this is going to affect this and, uh, and, and what we might see from this amount of testing. But we'll certainly be watching. And as she said, uh, the hospitalization epi curve and watching what that does uh, is, a, is a great measure of the stress on our healthcare system right now. Chad, do we have any other questions at this point? We have one uh, follow-up from Tom Scanlon. Okay. This will be our last question, follow. Tom. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure this out. It sounds like there are uh, thousands of tests coming from the state for the blitz, but you're saying there's not enough to test everyone in long-term facilities. If the state was targeted at long-term facilities, would there be enough test everybody there? I think what Dr. Sunshine was saying is, is that large medical, large health care providers in our community and across this country, they have access to a lot of testing because they're dealing with a lot of patients uh, all the time. And so that, uh, they have that supply at the ready along with the personal protective equipment in order to make sure their people are safe who are, who are administering the test out to whether it's in the field or in their healthcare facility. So that's one supply that's already located and that who's, that's who ADHS has partnered with for this blitz that they're calling it. Um, and so that's the difference. And then long-term care facilities in general are much smaller healthcare groups or healthcare facilities they might not necessarily have access to those tests unless they're coming through a public health organization like ours or ADHS and we're helping them get PPE, testing equipment, and things of that nature. So I think it's, uh, it's trying to understand the supply chain here. There's a supply chain whenever it comes to PPE and there's been a lot of discussion about that, but there's also a supply chain that we've, uh, that we've talked about every single week, a supply chain associated with testing and uh, we all know there's a shortage of certain parts of the test. Swabs have been the number one thing that there's been a shortage of. So, uh, uh, Tom, I think that uh, that's about the best answer we can give you on that one right now. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for their questions today. A lot of good questions. We have to wrap up for today. Uh, we will be uh, back next week, and we'll certainly send out advisories, let you know when we're going to have uh, some availability for reporters to ask questions of us and, uh, and let you know about various things the county is doing and county public health is doing to help people at this time during the pandemic. I want to thank everybody, uh, everybody in the public, for being with us on YouTube and Facebook as well. And uh, thank you to all those members of the media that have joined us today. We appreciate your good questions. See you next time.